everybody, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new, welcome. My name is Zoe, but most people know me as ZA Reptiles, and this is my Banana Ball Python Snicket, who will be joining us for today's video. And today's video is the annual Q&A. So there's a couple just like routine videos that I do every year for Hermes. It's kind of like that exciting time of year where we have like our traditions, in this case, Hermes and our traditional Hermes videos. Of course, then I mix in some others as well. But the Q&A is one of my traditional Hermes videos. I don't do tons of Q&As throughout the year because you guys typically just message me when you want to know something or ask in a comment. So if I constantly did Q&As, I would get no video or no questions. So I save for Hermes so that's only once a year. It's not overdone. But also today's Q&A is part of my second Hermes giveaway on Instagram. Now to enter this giveaway on Instagram for a $25 Pangea gift card, everyone had the opportunity to leave me up to three questions for this questionnaire, this Q&A on YouTube. And when I tell you, we got some amazing questions. Like this is going to be a good video, especially for those of you looking to get into the animal field. We got great questions. Without further ado, let's dive into it. I'm gonna pull out my phone. I don't wanna waste time because I wanna to try to get to all of the questions. I don't think we had any repeat questions. Our first question from June Zoo. Is there a dream animal you don't yet have? I'm very fortunate that I do own a lot of my dream animals. I kind of filter through and get them and then find a new dream animal. My current dream animal though, that I can legally own, I should say, because my dream animal is a black dragon and I can't legally own that here. Um, right now, I think it's between a Cayman Lizard and a Grand Cayman Hybrid Iguana because I really love Grand Cayman Iguanas. It'd be a great conservation topic for education programs. I love Iguanas and it's blue. But Cayman Lizards are amazing. So it's a toss up between those two. Um, my next video is going to be my updated again. This is another kind of traditional Hermes video. My updated reptile wish list where I give you my top 10 wish list animals, uh, herps. And this one's gonna be exciting because I think it's the most that my list has changed from year to year. So that'll be the next video, so keep an eye out for that. But moving on down the list, uh, bioactive underscore B uh, gave me two questions here. So the first one is, how did you manage your time in college with everything else that you do? And then the second part was, did you have all of your pets while you were in college? And if so, how did that affect anything? Now, this is fantastic because I started my channel when I was in college, right? I started my channel with just an iguana and a corn snake in college to become a zookeeper. So those of you who have been around a while were with me through college, internships, all the, that. If you're new here and you're interested in that, go back to some of my earlier videos to experience that all over again. But how did I manage it? So I constantly get told by people that they don't know how I live my life because I'm so busy, right? I've got my animals, I work full time, I'm a figure skater, I'm a skating coach, I do a reptile education, I have YouTube, I have an Etsy. Like I do a crap ton. And so I always get people asking me like, how do you do it all? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's a lot of work, it's exhausting. But let's break down this question. Starting with, did I have my animals in college? No. Um, freshman year and sophomore year, I kept fish. I had just a 10 gallon tank because that's all I could have on my campus. Junior year was when I moved off campus and I had Arcadius, my iguana. And then senior year was when it all got a little sticky. <laughs> so by the end of junior year, I had gotten Phoenix, my corn snake. So I just had the two of them. It was my senior year that, you know, I was preparing to graduate, go get a zoo job, move away. So I was gonna be on my own. And you know, that's when I started going to reptile expos without my parents around and realizing I had a little bit of freedom with my money, if you know what I mean. And that's when I got into trouble. So senior year, I only had one semester because I graduated early. So my fall semester, I did have 
the animals that I started getting. Uh, it still wasn't enough that it like stressed me out or distracted me or anything. Like I already had my routine with my iguana who was the most high maintenance one. So because I already had a good established routine with him, everybody else seemed super easy. So it wasn't anything crazy. Um, and how did you manage your time in college? Uh, so something I actually learned in my freshman year that was super helpful was to create create like a time blocked schedule for yourself and like color in the blocks for certain things because it helped me realize how much free time I actually had in my day after I counted in classes and skating. So I could see like, oh, I can use this block to go to the gym. I can use this block to go to the library and study. I can use this block for homework. I can use this block to like lay in bed and watch Netflix. So it was super helpful to just lay out my schedule like in a time blocked week so I could see like where I had gaps that could be useful. So that's kind of how I managed in college. Now that I'm working full time, it's a different story, but that was how I really like, and that really helped me in college. <laughs> so JJ's Reptile World, my good friend Jordan, her first question was, when are we meeting up at Tinley again? Uh, that was an excellent question. Um, once I have money to get myself to Tinley, hopefully by plane this time, because driving to Tinley last year, I had to, like, it was a week long trip just to make it to Chicago and back. But I would love to go to Tinley again. Her second question, and this is gonna be kind of a spoiler for the next video, is when are you getting a monkey tailed skink? And of course, she had to add, come on, Billy. Billy's my boyfriend, for those of you who don't know. I would die for a monkey tail skink. I really wanted one. We were looking at them at Tinley. Um, and then Jordan and I held off, we were being responsible, and then of course she went and got one without me after Tinley. So I'm still monkey tailed skinkless and she has one, but I don't know when I'm getting one. I would really like one, but home projects first. Okay, now we have Franny Batman. What's your favorite and least favorite part about working in zoos? So my favorite obviously is going to be the animals. That's why we all get into the zoo field, right? We want to work with the animals. Working with animals was great, being able to do enrichment, training. I pers personally really like the meal prep and nutrition side of things too, so that was really fun for me. Um, and then my least favorite part, the people. And I don't mean like the people that come to the zoo. I mean like the people you work with, of course. Some people are fantastic. I've had great coworkers, but you're not going to be able to avoid drama no matter how much you try there's politics in zoos and you're gonna get sucked into it usually just by department or by the area you work in so maybe you yourself aren't like specifically in it but if your department is in it or the area of your zoo is in it you're in it by default and it's really annoying and it hinders your work process and what you do at work against your will and yeah so the politics in zoos and the clicks, not my favorite. All right, for the love of Gek, asked a couple questions. How do you make your connections professionally for the animal industry, if at all? This is a fantastic question. I don't think I've ever been asked this or talked about this. So amazing, especially for those of you who want to get into the zoo field or work with animals. So how do I make my connections professionally for the animal field or animal industry? I did a couple of things. I live and grew up in this small town with nothing around. No zoos, no, I mean we have our animal shelter, but they're very clicky and like would not respond to any messages, emails, phone calls, anything. So I didn't get experience there. Um, but we did travel a lot because I am a competitive figure skater. So every time we traveled for a competition, we made sure to go to whatever zoo was around um, cause, you know, it got me out. I got to experience different zoos, kind of see where I might like to end up after college. But every time we went to a zoo, we tried to make a connection there. So we'd go to like keeper talks and we'd hang around afterwards so I could talk to the keeper about like what they did to get their job, what they did for school, what they did for internships. Um, so I did that. Um, any colleges I wanted to go to now, I only had one college I want to go to, so I'll we'll just focus on that one and what I did. I went to open houses, I did like any sort of like open anything where I could go and talk to the professors in that department so they would get to know me before I applied. 
and I hung around after a session, talked directly to the head of the department. Um, we talked about what classes I was taking my senior year, my junior and senior year of high school, and he basically said, we'll see you in the fall. Here I have the head of the department that I wanted to get into saying, we'll see you in the fall. So that was a really good connection to have. And um, once you're in college, if you choose to go to college, getting to know your professors really well because they have connections in the field. And that helped me with internships and whatnot. Also, social media. Social media has helped me connect with so many people. Now, this all happened pretty much after my college and zoo transition, like all of that stuff. Social media didn't really play a part in that. But now that I'm where I am and I've been on social media for a while, I've made lots of connections that have helped me kind of help other, like the local kids here. Like for example, for my day camps at the nature center, I did one that was focused on like different animal careers each day. And so I had a live speaker FaceTime into the, into the classroom every day for camp to talk to the kids about what it is they do. And so the kids could ask them questions. And you know, also getting to know Crosstown Exotics out in Chicago, Colin from Crosstown has become a really good mentor for me for, you know, pursuing my own education business. So social media, going to different zoos and talking to people or different facilities, maybe it's not a zoo, but going to different facilities and getting to know the people that work there, um, getting to know college professors, things like that. Networking is so important in this industry on top of your experience, but networking is also important. Next question, this is going to be a long video. How many hours or years of experience did you commit to before getting your education job? So if we're talking specifically about my education area with the animals, that is a personal business, that is my business. Um, I'm not hired by anyone to do that, that is, you know, my own business. So I could start that whenever. Uh, but how many years and experience? I did experience through college and then after college until I got a job. So I did all of my zoo and aquarium and shelter volunteers and internships in college. Graduated, worked part-time at the nature center because I knew I wasn't applying to jobs right away because we had a family trip planned and I wanted to focus on skating for that winter. So I worked somewhere that could give me extra beneficial experience on my resume in the meantime and then applied to zoos and whatnot. So um, really, it was like my junior and senior year of college was when I got my experience in internships and volunteer hours and whatnot. So it was really like two years. Um, the sooner the better. I unfortunately waited because, like I said, I grew up in an area where there isn't experience for people like me that wanted to get into that field. So I had to wait until college. Gabs underscore beasties. My daughter wants a career in herps. What advice would you give her? She's eight, but the best snake mom, and she loves all reptiles. I love that so much, and what a good question. So, your daughter wants a career in herps. What advice would you give her? Never stop learning. Never stop learning. And if you have any local zoos, museums, nature centers, anything like that, see if they will work with kids. See if they have a volunteer program for kids or any camps. Uh, a lot of zoos will do like a little zookeeper camp or zookeeper for a day. Anything like that, you can never start getting experience too young. It's only going to benefit you more if you start earlier. So the more things you can do growing up to be hands on, learn more, get more experience, that's going to be incredibly helpful and it's just going to make you a more knowledgeable herper too. All right. Uh, Ollie Exotics asks, what steps are first for becoming an animal educator? Um, so, oh gosh, where do I want to go with this? So, let me differentiate. We got zookeeper, animal educator. So I would recommend different things for both in the sense of animal education. People skills, public speaking skills, being able to stand in front of people and speak directly to them, get your point across, have some crowd control skills. So it's great to know things about the animals, but you want to work on your educator skills first. If you have a good educator skill set, working in the animals is the easy part. The hard part is the public speaking, the crowd control, um, being able to get your point across and, you know, adapt with what may happen. 
So animal educator, put the animals aside. First focus, being an educator. So it really helped me, especially getting like my zoo education job, my job at the nature center doing programs and whatnot, was I've been a skating coach since pretty much the fifth grade. You know, you start out as a skating coach assistant and then move up to a coach. But I've been doing that for like my whole life. So I've worked with kids, teenagers, whatever, of all different ages and skill sets for years and like different group sizes. So that really helped me a lot. Like that had nothing to do with animals at all. But when it came time to applying for animal education jobs, that stood out. So a little tippy there for you guys. Um, Nick's Reptile World, favorite Pangea Crested Gecko diet flavor. I have never been asked anything like that before. And I would probably have to say anything with insects in it, not for me personally, I've never tried them, but like for the geckos, non-insects, maybe papaya? Yeah, that's a fun one. I just have like this weird vendetta against watermelon because when I got Tula, my gargoyle gecko, I was told she'd only eat watermelon. So now I have like this weird vendetta against watermelon Pangea. I don't know what it is. All right, we're getting down there. We're almost done. This isn't going too long. Um, EW Exotics. Any idea what reptile you might get next in your last video showing your new pets, which would now be two videos ago, um, you said the Aki made you want another monitor. Would you get one? So any idea what reptile you might get next would not be a reptile, would actually be an amphibian because my education business is launching in the spring. So I'm trying to fill the gaps of where the, like, I'm trying to fill the gaps of what I don't have. And what I'm very short on is amphibians. So I would probably turn my focus to amphibians first um, before getting any other reptiles. But yeah, I'm looking at like maybe a toad, salamander. Um, and then would I get a monitor, another monitor besides my Aki monitor? Yes, <laughs> that would be one that wouldn't happen for a while because I would want a larger monitor, in which case I would need more space. I really want a blue tree monitor and I really like the lace monitors, especially seeing my friend Mason. You guys probably know me as Mason Barnes on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. He has lace monitors and they are gorgeous. And I really like them. So probably either lace monitor or peach throat though. I do really like peach throat monitors. I saw one at a pet store once and he was just uh, so sociable. Like even my mom wanted me to get him and I lived with her at the time. So yeah, I totally would get another monitor. Not for a while, but I would totally get another one. For the love of Gek asked another question. Here's the third question. What is the best way to structure a resume for getting a zookeeping or educator job? These questions are like spot on, on a roll. I feel like I need to do a separate Q&A video specifically for these questions. Make sure your experience is on there and like really like talk up what you did, okay? If you had any hands in training sessions, put that in there. Diet prep and nutrition, put it in there. Speaking to the public, put it in there. So put every piece of experience and really just don't take anything you did for granted because every little thing you do in your experience is going to help you. Even if it's not relating to the animals at all, like interacting with the public, that is still very important. Don't leave that stuff out. Uh, here's another question from Franny Batman. What animal would you keep if there were no limitations at all? We're we talking about like no limitations in the world or like the like New York. If we're just talking like New York state rules, like if the state didn't have rules, then a black dragon or a Gila monster or a beaded lizard. Cause I really want those two, but they're venomous. So I can't have them. So one of those, no limitations in the world. Dare I say a Komodo dragon? I like, I like my lizards big. I like all my reptiles big and my vivids. I, I just like everything big. And now we have a Luca baby 84. How do you feel about hybrids? I have a Crested Jehua hybrid who's a pet only. And I feel like he's the best of both worlds in every way. In his case, I think it's cool that a Crested and Chihua are known to naturally hybridize in their native region. 
I will be completely honest, I don't know anything about hybridized reptiles. Like, I know nothing about that, so I feel like I can't really give an opinion. You say it naturally happens in their native region, so if it's something that naturally, like, happens, then I don't really see a problem with it. So now we have a question from Layla. What are you most proud of accomplishing in 2022, you guys, with these questions? Okay, so I got two questions here. Um, what am I most proud of accomplishing in 2022? Well, we got a house, right? That was like, took years. We have a house. I am in a room right now where there's only animals and not a bed. I don't have to share my room with any animals. Um, most proud getting a house and getting my motivation back and like putting in the work again. Like we're doing it. We're doing it. Oh, oh, wait, I know, I know. Most proud, finally taking the leap and starting slash announcing my education business. I have been talking about it for what, four years? Four years now? And it's finally, I finally said I'm doing it. I made it public. I handed out little flyers. Like we are doing it. I have a banner. Um, her second half of the question, her second question. How would you go about becoming an animal educator both with and without college? That's a good question. Uh, with college, take education classes. I didn't take any like education classes under the education major type of area, but I did have a conservation education class that I took under my major, where we worked with the local schools. We learned how to lesson plan, we came with our own lessons, and they were all based around like conservation, um, their community garden, so it was still science-based. And so that was really helpful because we have basically learned how to be teachers. And like I kind of mentioned earlier for a different question, any public speaking, any education, anything like that, very helpful. So especially if you're looking to do it without college, get involved, do internships. You can do this without school. Internships, volunteer work, anything you can do to get your hands working with animals and get yourself working with the public in a way where you can speak to others, teach others, stand up, do some public speaking. All of that will be super helpful with animal education. Katie's Critters, do you feel the longevity in your new lighter weight enclosures is the same as the ones like Exoterra or Glass Aquariums? So what she's referring to are the Dubia.com enclosures. Now I have not had them that long, so I feel like I can't really say. I will say for the price you're paying and for the material, I do not expect them to hold up like my wooden enclosures. You guys know most of my enclosures we built or I got from Talking Serpents. They're wooden, they're thick, they're sturdy. The reason for that and why I went that route is because I want my enclosures all to stack. So that's why I went the wood route because I feel like they're very sturdy and they're stackable and they hold up really well. So uh, for the price I pay for those or for the work that goes into doing them, I do not expect any other enclosures to hold up like those enclosures do. But for what you're paying for the Dubia.com enclosures, I think they're fantastic. Now, I am currently in the process of testing them being stacked. I am about to put, hopefully today, some substrate in the top one so I can see how the floor holds up. Um, so stay tuned for that. But I, I see them lasting a long time. If you take good care of them and whatnot, I don't see why they wouldn't last a long time. But I feel like it's not a fair comparison to compare them to like my wooden enclosures. Because I feel like that's comparing like apples to oranges. <laughs> um, although you mentioned Exoterra and Glass Aquariums. Does anything really compare to Glass Aquariums and Exoterras? I feel like those are like extremely sturdy. Those are some heavy duty enclosures. <laughs> Alright, Kelly Nicole has two questions. And these are good questions. Okay, do you ever get overwhelmed at times with your pets? If so, what causes it? What a great question, especially because like people, you see YouTubers, you see influencers, you see people on Instagram with lots of reptiles. Do they get overwhelmed? I bet they do. I do sometimes. Mine more so stems from the fact that I have a neurologic condition called occipital neuralgia. And I 
get flare-ups from many different things. Weather, barometric pressure, if it rains, if it snows, if I'm stressed, if I'm overtired. Um, like, I, I will be bedridden, basically, or just extremely nauseous. I have a hard time going through my day. When that happens, I do start to feel overwhelmed because I feel like I can't accomplish what I want to or I can't accomplish things at the pace I want to accomplish them. And then that stresses me out more. So that will cause me to get overwhelmed. However, if I'm feeling great and fine and dandy, I'm not overwhelmed. You know, and what really helps me is I do have my animals on a schedule. If you have lots of animals, I do recommend either making a feeding chart, a feeding schedule, a animal chore schedule, something so that you can keep everything in track. You're not going to miss something. The more animals you have, the easier it is to miss something, mess up something. So having a set schedule, a chart, something to physically look at and check off is extremely helpful. So I highly recommend that if you have multiple animals. Hope that my camera is flashing at me like it's gonna die. Oh my god, there's still a lot of questions. I thought we were almost done. Oh. Uh, Kelly Nicole's second question. If you could live in one of your enclosures for a day, which would it be and why? What a fun question. Um, I'm probably gonna have to say Alfredo, my legless lizard, because I put a lot of work into that background. He's got a ton of rock to climb on, and I just think it'd be like super fun. Uh, okay, Dahlia Brown, when did you start reptile keeping? Um, technically, I got my first reptile going into my senior year of high school. We got our leopard gecko Zephyr. Um, I officially got my first reptile that was all mine my going into my junior year. So the end of my sophomore year of college was when I got my Iguana Arcadius. So I guess that was technically kind of when I officially, officially started. And that was four, five, six, seven years ago, something like that. Six, seven years ago. Plus more if you count when we got Zephyr. Because he was in my room and I was the one that wanted him. <laughs> All right, my phone had died, or my camera had died. So we're gonna see if we can quickly finish powering through these questions um, before my camera dies a second time. What animal that's commonly kept in the hobby do you think shouldn't be and why? I'll give my generic and I'll give a new one after I straighten my camera. So. Uh, generic, obviously green iguanas. You guys have heard me talk about that a lot, so I feel like I don't need to go into detail. But to switch it up and give something different, I've been feeling this a lot this past year, snapping turtles. We're talking common snapping turtles and alligator snapping turtles. I feel like they're way too easy for people to get their hands on, and they're a big turtle. Turtles are highly mistreated anyway as it is and their care is a little more complicated and complex than people make it out to be. And then when you throw in a really big one that needs a lot of space, people can't even give their painted turtles and sliders enough space. And so I don't think alligator snapping turtles or common snapping turtles should be quite so easily excessive. Accessible, that's what I was going for. Um, for Annie Batman, what was your first herp? Our family leopard gecko Zephyr, Emma KXNG. What's your favorite thing about keeping reptiles? Ooh, that's really deep. Um, I would say my favorite is getting to know the individual reptile. So you'll notice I don't have a lot of repeat species. I have three ball pythons, three fat tail geckos, two crested geckos. But other than that, really, all of my animals are different species. I enjoy that they each have their own needs, they each have their own personalities, they all come from different areas. Like I just like how different each species is right down to each individual. Like I really enjoy that. Um, another question from Emma, could you show all of your program pets? That's a good one. So yes, in the spring, or not even in the spring, but after Hurtmas, I'll start doing more education um, videos, like videos based off of my education business. I've gotten a request for more videos that have to do with that, so I'll absolutely add that to the list. Um, because, you know, pretty much all of my program, or all of my animals are program animals, but there are some that are not. And there are some that get used more than others. So I'll certainly add that to the list. Um, another Aunt Amanda question. What is your limit of number of pets you'd get? What a good question, especially for a video on YouTube. People always accuse YouTubers of getting tons of pets, not being able to care for them properly. Here's the thing, there is no set number, at least for me. I feel like 
you know yourself best. You know how you're feeling, you know your schedule, you know what you're capable of. So there is no set number because that number will always change. For me, when I had 10, 11 reptiles at that time, it felt like I had a lot. I have double that now and it, it's still, it's very manageable because it's like the longer I have those animals, I get into routine, it all becomes easy and I feel okay adding on more animals. Now, do I recommend this many animals for the generic reptile keeper? Maybe not. I mean, I have a pretty manageable number. Like, I don't have near the amount that many other keepers do. Like, I still have quite a bit less than a lot of people. But part of the reason I have so many is because I do education programs and I'm starting an education business. So I need to have a good variety. I need ones from different areas of the world. I need different talking standpoint so I've got um, invasive species, endangered species, snakes, lizards, legless lizard. So I need that variety especially because I'm not making my animals do multiple programs multiple days in a row. I need to be able to switch them out, give them days off type of thing. But for me personally I think even if I wasn't doing programs I probably would still have this many animals. So there is no limit, there is no number, it just depends on me in the moment making sure that I'm paying attention to how I feel and how I think I'm doing, how much I can handle at the time. So I don't put a number on it. Waylon, 9216, what made you want to pursue a career in reptile education? What would you do differently and what advice would you give to someone starting out? Um, so what made me want to pursue a career in reptile education? Um, I started out with zookeeping. Through the Nature Center, I did some educational programs with my animals and really enjoyed it. And then of course I got a job as a zoo educator. And I realized that there's things that are different about zoo education. And you know, the director at the zoo I worked at used to call the educators the rock stars. You know, the zookeepers were behind the scenes rock stars, but we were the rock stars because we were the ones the public saw. We were the ones being attached to these memories and to the, like when we bring the animals, the kids get to see these animals, interact with these animals, learn about these animals. We were the ones they were seeing. And I really liked that. I liked having that kind of like knowing that I was going to be in those kids' memories. So, you know, when these kids think about these amazing experiences, I'm responsible for that or I'm tied to that. And I really enjoyed that. And I feel like there's so many important messages out there, and especially with reptiles and amphibians. They're so underrated. They're so misunderstood that being an educator, you get to kind of clear the air of those things and create this love and appreciation for them. So that was really um, a key thing that made me want to pursue reptile education. And what would I do differently? What advice would I give to someone starting out? I don't think I'd really do anything differently. Um, my path really just kind of helped solidify what I wanted to do. So I don't think I would do anything differently. Um, what advice would you give to someone starting out? I feel like we've talked about this enough in this video, so I'm going to keep going just to keep it moving. But, you know, experience. Um, Am Mockle, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, says is, or asks, is there anything you did during high school or before professionally working with animals that helped you? Uh, we kind of answered this already too. I didn't really have anywhere to volunteer or intern in my local town, um, but you know, traveling to lots of different zoos, talking to keepers at different zoos, that's what I did throughout high school. Um, I also took like college level biology classes. Uh, K Snoga, Snaga, 22. What is the greatest lesson you have learned over time keeping reptiles? Amazing. Um, the learning is never done. That is the biggest thing. You may feel like an expert. You may feel like you're on top of the world. Guarantee a year from now, information's going to change again. Keep learning. Swag Welder. Would you recommend starting an education program to others? I'm a current biology teacher and lover of reptiles and am thinking of starting a side business. For certain people, absolutely. In your case, it sounds like you would be a good fit for an education program because you already are a teacher, you have experience with teaching, and you love reptiles. So that's a good mix right there. It's a great thing to get into if you are truly passionate about teaching, you are good with working with the public, and you love reptiles. So for people like teachers, absolutely. Um, I see a lot of reptile keepers trying to jump in and this is where I'm going to be the bad guy. I don't think it's for everybody because there are many things that go into it. 
like being able to manage a crowd, speak to a crowd, but also be very mindful of your animal and how the animal is feeling. There's a lot of multitasking. While you're speaking and keeping your train of thought, you're managing a crowd, you're managing your animal, you're making sure everyone is safe, having a stress-free time. Like there's a lot that goes on. So, and I have seen people do it very poorly and I have seen people do it really well. So would I recommend doing it? I love it, so of course, but I don't think it's for everybody, but you know, you know yourself best. If it's something you're interested in, I think go for it, or at least do more research. Maybe have one-on-one -on -one conversations with other educators so you can like really ask your questions and get to know um, kind of more details. But uh, in general, yes, but I think it takes the right type of person to do it. Um, and you have to like people. You you can't just be in it for the animals only you have to like people and talking to people um to be an educator uh another emma question what got you into wanting to keep reptiles um my biology teacher in high school had a leopard gecko in the classroom and that's where that started but growing up my favorite parts of the zoos were always the reptile buildings so i really should have known another amanda question could you make a video of your favorite things you bought for your reptiles this year what a good idea, absolutely. Another swag welder, how many reptiles is too many reptiles asking for a friend? Answered that question earlier, let's keep going. We have two questions left. My camera's blinking again, we got two left. Uh, Heidi's herps, what reptile are you thinking about getting next? Talked about that earlier. What do you recommend, Aki or jeweled lacerta? Jeweled lacertas have my heart. Like, I, I can't pick anything over a jeweled lacerta unless we're talking about iguanas. Um, I will always, jewel lacertos, I feel like are an animal I will always keep. How are your cute Amazon milk frogs doing? They are doing wonderful, thank you for asking. Uh, now we have LB Reptiles, the final person with questions. How did you become a zookeeper? I have lots of videos on this, so for the sake of this video, I am not going to go into detail, but I went to college, took lots of animal classes and zoo classes, uh, did internships in zoos, and went from there, applied to different places and whatnot. Um, so just keep that short and simple because I have tons of videos on that here on YouTube. Did you get all of your experience from your own animals that led to you to be where you are today? No, I started doing internships and volunteering before I had any of my own animals. I did multiple internships in the zoo, working with sea lions, river otters, polar bears, um, life support systems, reptiles, amphibians. Um, I did one at the aquarium with fish and penguins and invertebrates. Um, what else did I do? What else did I do? What else did I do? Um, I volunteered at the local SPCA as the reptile, uh, enrichment coordinator, I guess you could call me. Um, so yeah, I did lots of, er, and that was after I got reptiles. Well, now that it's 5.30 outside and dark, let me finish this video since my camera has so kindly decided to charge now. So we were on the very last question. I think for the most part I had answered it, but I think there was one other little part to it that I feel like I should revisit. Um, we left off with, did you get your experience from your own animals? Okay, so I said no, but I want to continue my answer with saying that having my own animals absolutely did help me because I see in your next part of your question, you put your wondering if you could pass by having and getting experiences from your own animals. That will certainly help. I can't say whether or not that will be enough experience for what it is you want to do. That will depend on where you're applying and what they're looking for, but it certainly does help. That was another reason for me having all of my animals was it was very hard for me to get hands-on experience with reptiles and that's what I wanted to do. So I knew I needed to get reptile experience somehow. So I did it on my own in my own house and it ended up working out great for me. And with that being said, that is our final question. So thank you to everyone that submitted questions. I have two and a half hours until I draw the winner. So I'm glad we finally got this video done. What fantastic questions. I'm gonna have to redo some of these for a separate animal industry, animal field video because they were fantastic and I don't want them to get lost. I want people to find those questions because they were amazing. So this video will come out in the spring or something like that. We'll redo it with those questions because holy cow, you guys ask amazing questions. 
I've never been more excited to film a Q&A, honestly. So anyway, Merry Hermes, and we'll see you for the next video. Thank you guys, and bye bye <laughs>